afternoon, everyone. Happy Black History Month. Good. All power to the people. So we thank you for coming to our annual Dinely Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm Dr. Anthony Asadala Samad. I'm the Executive Director of the Mervyn Dinely African American Political Union and Economic Institute here at California State University, Dominguez Hills. And we wanted to make sure that in our first post-COVID Distinguished Speaker Series that we brought someone who could speak to the time uh, with a band. Now, I know many of you are asking, why would we bring a white woman <laughs> on the first day of Black History Month? And I say to you, white people celebrate Black History too. They don't stop at Martin Luther King Day. You know, what's more historical in our nation than racism. It's been here since before 1619. Most of the time we celebrate Black History Month with stories of achievement, and that's nice. But we also have to speak to the times. And the times dictate that we still have a long way to go as it relates to race relations here in the United States, and they have become more complex. And everybody's willing to talk about it except you know who. And so this is our way to invite our brothers and sisters of European descent into the conversation. And who better to participate and lead the discussion than a, an anti-racist scholar who has written two best-selling, New York Times best-selling books on the vulnerability of white people when it comes to talking about race. So we have a little video introduction and then we will bring up our vice president of diversity, equity, and inclusion to give the formal introduction to this year's Dodley Distinguished Speaker. Thank you. Turn your attention to the screen. is met with white rage. In fact, white people measure the value of our lives by the absence of people of color. We literally have laws on the books uh, that say you cannot say that racism is real, that we go cradle to grave not only in segregation with no sense of loss, but using the absence of black people mm. as the measurement of value. I'm just gonna ask a rhetorical question of people coming in the room. How often have you tried to talk to a white person about our inevitable and often unaware racist patterns and perspectives and assumptions and had that go well for you? Sorry, I mean, white folks that grow up poor or working class, you could say that to be poor and working class and white is the same as to be poor and working class and black. I always knew I was white, and being white has absolutely helped me navigate class. What is my definition of a racist? It's always hard coming behind someone who has about a foot 
height on you, so give me a moment to adjust the microphone here. Um, hello again and welcome to the Diamond League Distinguished Speaker Series featuring Dr. Robin D'Angelo. I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for this afternoon, but before doing so, I ask that you indulge me in a moment of privilege to speak to an issue that I bring with me to this podium today. On this first day of Black History Month, a time of reverence, celebration, and recognition of the innumerable contributions of African Americans in this country, my heart is heavy. Many of you may not know this, but I lived the first 10 years of my adult life in Memphis, Tennessee, where I received a higher education, found my life partner, made lifelong friends, and started my family with my first two children being born there. When you hear me say that I'm going home for a visit, I'm likely talking about Memphis. Today, in that city that I regard as home, Tyree Nichols' family held funeral services to lay him to rest. If you've been following the news, you know that Tyree is yet another unarmed black man who was killed by the police. While my heart would be heavy, regardless of where this happened, there's something different when it happens in your hometown. So taken together, this Black History Month is already meaning something different to me. And the conversations we will have, and the events we will hold, and the actions we will take, I will be thinking about Tyree. As a mother of three black sons, I will be thinking about his mother, and I will be thinking about those who loved and knew him best. I'll also be thinking about black liberation in this country and the urgent need for doing the necessary work of racial justice and black humanity. Our speaker today will lead us in a conversation where we will look racial injustice in the face and begin to wrestle with it. Switching gears here, I had the pleasure of joining a few Kansas stakeholders and lunch with Dr. D'Angelo earlier today. And I'm looking forward to her remarks. But before we get there, I said you join me in a moment of silence in recognizing and remembering Tyree Nichols. Thank you. So again, going back to this lunch, um, I had the privilege of joining with some colleagues and speaking to Dr. D'Angelo. I'm really looking forward to the remarks that she'll share today. In her remarks, I expect that, and from what she previewed um, into the, the direction she's going to take, she's going to help us understand that within discussions about race, in whiteness, there's the persistent issue of anti-blackness, not only interpersonally, but structurally. And I look forward to listening and learning from her today. For those who may be unfamiliar with Dr. D'Angelo, she is an affiliate associate professor of education at the University of Washington. Her area of research is in whiteness studies and critical discourse analysis, where she traces how whiteness is reproduced in everyday narrative. She has numerous publications and books, including White Fragility, which I think many of us, if not all of us, are familiar, but White Fragility, why it is so hard for white people to talk about racism, which spent over three years on the New York, sellers, uh, New York Times bestseller list and has been translated into 12 languages. But she didn't leave her work there. She recently released her follow-up book in um, June of 2021, um, and the title of that, and we have copies available for you in the, um, in the front here, is Nice Racism, How Progressive White People Perpetuate Racial Harm. Her work has been featured in many forums and influenced international di dialogue on race. Please
please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Dr. Robin D'Angelo. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, and I must tell you, I'm from Seattle, so walking in the sunshine is just heavenly. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for that, too. Um, I'm going to be talking about nice racism today, or the nicer, so-called nicer forms of racism. Uh, and that may seem odd, as, as Dr. Anthony acknowledged, to be, be talking about and hearing from a white person on the first day of Black History Month. But it's really, really critical that we understand that racism is a relationship. I wasn't raised to see it as a relationship. I was raised to see it as something that happened to them. Uh, and since I had nothing to do with that, I wasn't a part of that. I was raised not to see myself in racial terms. I understood that Dr. Porter had a race, and I expected that if we were going to be talking about racism, we'd be talking about her race and her experience. I wasn't raised to see myself in those terms. I'm very clear today that I'm white. So let me just draw your attention to that fact if you hadn't already been thinking about it. And I'm going to speak from that position. It's a limited position, but it's, but it's a very important position. So I want to be really clear that I don't believe that I could articulate anywhere near to the degree that I can articulate what whiteness looks and feels like and how it manifests if I wasn't learning and having been mentored for many, many years from black people and other people of color. From a very early age, people of color have to know my experience uh, in order to survive, in order to navigate the society and its institutions uh, in a way that I have not had to know their experience. Right? I can be seen as qualified to do or lead virtually anything without understanding, having any interest in understanding an alternate racial experience. Okay. But I do have a piece of this incredibly complex puzzle that folks of color don't have. Right. As an insider of whiteness, I can speak to it, I can lay it out, and I can admit to things that we will seldom ever admit to, those of us who are white. So while I'm going to speak uh, as a white person to very common white patterns. Uh, I'm hoping that that is useful for uh, folks of color uh, and black folks here today in that um, you have to navigate us, you have to deal with these patterns, these unconscious assumptions, uh, and you are often left to think maybe you're making it up. <laughs> you are not making it up. It's, it's actually happening, and so I hope affirming that and helping you understand how we come to be so often so difficult on this topic, I hope that that will be useful for you. So if we can start, we'll go to the next slide. So just keep in mind that anti-racism is a framework. Uh, and in this particular political moment, that's important to say. So, you know, I wish I was so powerful that I could brainwash people, I am not. Uh, I am simply going to offer you a framework for thinking about uh, a very, very uh, enduring uh, dynamic in this country. And this particular framework will drive you to ask different questions and therefore come up with different strategies and responses to that issue uh, that are different than what the mainstream framework gives you. So that, that frees us up from you know, arguing or debating or you know, is this right or is this wrong. We're just going to try it on and see how it changes how we see uh, the issues. So next. So it's 2023 and we have got to be able to engage in this issue with complexity and nuance. So let me, let me take a moment to tell you I've got about an hour, hour and a half with you. I'm not solving race relations today. I'm not getting this right by everybody. It's much too sensitive and much too complex for any one person to get it right. Uh, but I do think that I can offer some useful and some challenging, provocative ways of, of thinking about 
uh, thinking about where we are in this country today and why uh, by every measure across every institution, despite the claims that we've, we've heard and made, uh, black and brown people are at the bottom by every measure. So, so I am going to start with a quote by Dr. King, since it is the first day of Black History Month. This comes from his letter from a Birmingham jail. Uh, first, I must confess that over the last few years, I've been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's council or the Ku Klux planner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you see, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically feels he can set the timetable for another man's freedom. There's so much in this quote that, that I want to pull out, but I want to remind you of something that Dr. Porter mentioned, and she talked about black liberation. So we have to ask ourselves, liberation from whom or what? Who has put that yoke around the neck, if you will? Right? Who is on the other end of that relationship? Uh, shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. And what I love about this quote is he's talking about me. He's talking about people like me. And we might not use the language of mod white moderate. Uh, I would say white progressive. But I have made a rather controversial claim in my book, White Fragility, that I get asked about a lot. And that is that I think that well-meaning white progressives cause the most daily harm across race. And you may wonder, how, how can you say that when white nationalism is on the rise, when being explicitly racist is actually uh, permissible in a way today that I haven't seen it in my life since pre-civil rights, uh, when young white men or boys are, are the number one target for recruitment into white nationalism? These are very serious issues, but I'm not a white nationalist. And if I focus there, I'm going to exempt myself. I'm going to reinforce what I call the good-bad binary. Those are the racists over there. Those are the bad people. And I am not racist. I am a good person. Right? And racism is a system that we're all in. And so I cannot exempt myself. So the way I think of it is my manifestation of my conditioning into a white supremacist society uh, my manifestation of that condition doesn't look like white nationalism, but it looks like something. And it's on me to continually ask what it looks like, to be accountable to others who are on the receiving end of my particular forms, uh, and to continue to try to challenge those. So that's what I'm going to focus on uh, in this talk. So next slide. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's kind of hard to talk to a lot of white folks about racism. Right? Uh, I'm going to give you a great example here. I was recently going to give a, a, a talk to a large tech company, and before they would sign the contract, the legal department wanted to see my slides. And I thought, okay, well, it's going to be all over. I'm probably not going to get it. Uh, they only had issue with one single slide. And think about that as I go through this deck. This is the slide they had issue with. I haven't even shown you the bullets on it yet. They actually came to me and said, could you take the word white off the slide? I don't know that there's a more perfect example of why it's so hard to talk to white people about racism, right? Like, do you have to say white supremacy? Can you use different language? And this calls back to Dr. King's quote, right? Like, let's keep folks comfortable. Let's not have tension, right? I would say it's on you to get up to date with white are people who are informed in this field using that language. What, what does it mean? I, I was raised to think about white supremacy as people in white hoods, and I now understand that it is a, a very descriptive sociological term for the society we live in. A society which holds white people up as the human ideal. 
as the standard or norm for what it means to be human, and other folks as a deviation, an inferior deviation from that standard. So, um, well, one reason it's really hard to talk to us is because I've never met a white person who didn't have an opinion on this topic. Have you? If you're not sure, just bring it up next time you're around a bunch of white people and stay on it for a couple rounds past the superficial platitudes and watch not only how opinionated we are, but how emotional we are about those opinions. So let me be clear. I don't think you can grow up in this society and not develop an opinion on racism. That doesn't make it informed. So let me say maybe one of my first controversial things. If you're white and you have not devoted years of sustained study, struggle, uh, and action on this issue, you cannot have an informed opinion. You'll have an opinion, it will not be informed. It's, it's much too deep and much too complex. And playing on a diverse sports team doesn't give you an informed opinion. Right? Well, we see ourselves as unique individuals. This is another thing that really gets people's back up. Wait a minute, you're generalizing. So let me be clear here. I don't know anybody in this room. I don't know your stories or your backgrounds or all of the unique things about those stories and those backgrounds. Uh, you are, of course, unique individuals, but we are also members of social groups. And by virtue of our member in these social groups and the racial groups in particular, we could literally predict whether you and your mother were going to survive your birth. That is how profound it is to be in this racial hierarchy and the positions that we inhabit. So we need to suspend our focus on how different we are and be willing to grapple with the collective. There is a collective experience and we have to be willing to, to look at it. And wherever, you, if you're white, any moment you think, oh, I'm different from that, great, good for you, <laughs> then ask yourself, how has being white shaped that thing that you think makes you an exception to what I'm saying? So the next one is, we don't tend to understand the systemic nature of racism. Uh, we're much further today uh, than, than we used to be, but I'm gonna take a little bit of time here because it is so critical. If we don't have a shared understanding of systemic racism, we're not gonna be able to have a conversation that makes any sense, and we're gonna guarantee some defensiveness and some upset. So, let's, let's be clear that there is no such thing as human objectivity. All human beings have biases, and all human beings act on those biases. So everybody has bias and everybody discriminates. Right? I'm using the terms bias and prejudice interchangeably, and I highly recommend Stanford University's Dr. Jennifer Everhart's new book on, called Bias, where she pulls together all that research. So everybody has it, uh, and everybody does it, right? But systemic racism is what happens when one group's collective bias I don't have the clicker, so this is my little signal. <laughs> um, is backed with legal authority and institutional control. That transforms it into a far-reaching system uh, that becomes the status quo, 24-7, 365, built into the foundations, the norms, the policies, the practices, the institutions, business as usual, unremarkable, and no individual has to do anything to have it at play, and in, in the case of white folks, to benefit overall from that system. So let's look at the halls of power. You know, the, the student body of this university is quite diverse. But let's look at the halls of power in this country, and do notice that the faculty and staff doesn't uh, typically reflect the student body. All right. so. The presidency has been 99% white. The vice presidency, 99% white. The Congress, 85% white. The governors, 98% white. Mayors, 88% white. Military advisors, 99% white. Federal judges, 88% white. Police officers, 80% white. People who decide which TV shows we see, 93% white. 
people who decide which books we read, 90% white. People who decide which news is covered, 85% white. People who decide which music is produced, 95% white. School teachers, 80% white. Full-time college professors, 84% white. Owners of men's pro football teams, 97% white. And owners of men's pro basketball teams, 98% white. The players in this case are 75% white. The homogeneity alone would guarantee that the biases, and sometimes those biases are simply not being aware of other people's realities or needs in the most benign sense, uh, but it guarantees that their advantages, their perspectives, their worldviews will be built into all the norms and the fabric of the society. And this is, you know, this is 2022 and 2023. These are not fluid systems. They don't change overnight. Those who control the halls of power in this country continue to do so. And I, if, I have a slide that's very similar that has it broken down by gender. They're also overwhelmingly male. Okay, so one group's collective racial bias backed by legal authority and institutional control. I am a visual learner, so I spend a lot of time looking for images that I think succinctly capture a concept that can be a little bit abstract. And I think the next click is gonna be my visual uh, of those, yeah, it is. So this is the House Freedom Caucus. This is a very, what I would call, amplified. Uh, this is a, a group of highly conservative um, senators and Congress people. You see uh, Pence in the center of that. This was taken during um, Trump's uh, time in office. But look at the homogeneity of this room. <laughs> you can think about it as who's sitting at the table making decisions that affect the lives of those who are not sitting at those tables. And if we're being honest, who those who are sitting at the tables have never been shown or taught or conveyed that it's valuable to have their interests represented at that table. I want you to imagine walking into that room and saying, maybe you also get, to get some diversity here. And I want you to imagine how well that might go. Okay. Um, they were literally discussing the health care bill when this photo was taken. So I repeat, sitting at tables making decisions that affect the lives of those who are not at the tables. And just in case you think I'm picking on white men, this is a classic board of a nonprofit. And uh, for me, as I'm a cisgender woman, my pronouns are she, her, I would, I would not want to walk into that first room. <laughs> I would find that to be a hostile environment, especially if I expressed what I was experiencing in that room. But I could be in this room and conveying a hostile environment to a woman of color. White women do not have any less racism because, just because we also experience sexism and patriarchy. So we have to use it as a way in, but not as a way out. Okay. All right. Keep going. So now we're going to look in at the specific example of state-sanctioned discrimination against African Americans, what is also called anti-blackness. This next slide is going to be deliberately dense. Uh, it's my one-slide history lesson. Uh, it's meant to convey uh, a sense of history and also really uh, overwhelm you <laughs> with the depth across our history of anti-blackness, so gird your bellies. Oh, I guess we have a slide just before that. Which is, I, I want to talk a little bit more about anti-blackness before I show you that slide. So, I want to be really clear. All peoples who are not perceived or defined as white experience racism and they experience it in ways that are shared, that they may relate to across their groups, and they experience it in ways that are specific to their groups. So to, to really have what I think of as racial literacy, we have to understand those histories, those cultures, those differences, the relationship of different groups to whiteness. In other words, what's in my head about Asian heritage people is different than what's in my head about indigenous people, and so on. Right? There's been different histories and struggles, and some of those groups are more comfortable for white people, so they get a little closer. Some are less comfortable. Right? And to really be fluent 
You have to understand those differences. Now, I, I have a, a relatively short period of time with you, and it's Black History Month, and we're gonna look at the specific relationship between black and white, uh, because I believe that the ultimate anchors that hold this construct in place, and it is a construct, right? There's no true race at the biological level, but as a social idea, it is profound in its meaning and consequence for our lives. White on one end and black on the other. They hold that in place. And how your position between those two poles shapes your experience of racialization and the racial hierarchy. I believe that in the white mind, black people are the ultimate racial other. And my saying that does not mean to minimize the profound uh, racism uh, and genocide that has been perpetrated towards indigenous peoples. It doesn't mean to minimize the racism towards Latinx peoples. But anti-blackness cuts across every single group. And every single group, including black people, have to ask themselves, what does anti-blackness look like amongst our group? And how has it been used to separate us and to break alliances that could serve all of us? All right, and here we go. So, trajectory of anti-blackness from the founding of the country to the current time. If you notice, less than a quarter of the way through this slide, it says bans on testifying against whites, which made it technically legal to murder black people in this country, and I'm sure we're all could ask, isn't it not still technically legal? But nonetheless, it was on the books, right there, less than a quarter of the way into that slide, and that's my lifetime. It's the lifetime of some people in this room. This isn't the distant past, and it wasn't ended <laughs> during the civil rights period. If you go about halfway down this slide, where you see employment discrimination, you are now in 2023 with copious empirical evidence. So I'm gonna pick it up there. Employment discrimination, educational discrimination, bias laws, police violence, white flight, subprime mortgages, mass incarceration, school to prison pipeline, disproportionate special education referrals and punishment, Testing, tracking, school funding, biased media, voter suppression, cultural ridicule, historical omissions, domestic terrorism, undermining of civil rights gains, unaddressed trauma, and so on. It's a system, it's a system we're in, and no one in this room was or could be exempt from the forces of this system. We might respond to it in a range of ways, but we must respond to it because this is what we're in. And smiling doesn't interrupt it, and niceness doesn't interrupt it, and playing on that black, uh, having a black roommate. Right? These things do not interrupt the system. And African Americans are not and have never been in the position to do this to the entire white collective but the white collective has always been in, and remains in the position to do this to African Americans. So, I hope this goes without saying in this audience, there is no such thing as reverse racism. Yes, they're just as biased as we are. This is what happens when you back my group's bias with legal authority and institutional control. And we have to have language that acknowledges the profundity of that difference. So this is why I don't use just uh, the term racism or racist to talk about people of color's bias. Now, do they internalize the same messages of anti-blackness? Can they act on those? Yes. What does that uphold and who does that serve? It still upholds white supremacy and it serves white people. I think the example of Ty Nichols is a powerful example of internalizing the messages of anti blackness All right, so there are cultural dimensions, of course, of this white supremacy or this idea of white as the human ideal. So I'll just give you a couple examples. Uh, to me, when, it, when I was looking for a single visual 
to represent the concept of white supremacy. This is, this is what I chose. Uh, God creating man. Um, you don't, as a child, I was raised Catholic, so I saw lots of iconography growing up. And as a child, when you look up, I wasn't thinking, oh, God is white. But it's never having to think that. It's, it's, it's the relentlessness of having your own image reflected back to you. Right? So that literally God is white. Now, Jesus and Mary uh, were not white. Everybody, I hope, I hope nobody's freaking out right now. <laughs> they were not white. Uh, but to render them white is very powerful. Adam and Eve, the first humans, the first humans also were not white. These are, you know, skeletons we might study in, you know, an anatomy class, and I did a close-up because even with their skin off, they're white. <laughs> uh, and, you know, when we see models of the human body and its ideal state, you know, it, it, this, is, this is often the images that we see. So this is a slide I made. I don't know this guy. I just Googled white guy. Um, <laughs> I'm like, that's a good one. Okay, so I think, I think most of us understand that a very deep part of our socialization comes from media, movies, television, right? Um, and that so much of the way we see the world is shaped by what we've consumed across our lives from movies right, or TV shows. So those who write and direct film are our cultural narrators or authors, and they shape the way we see ourselves, the way we see others, and the way we see ourselves in relationship to others. They get to actually represent the other, regardless of whether they are in relationship with the other at all. So of the 100 top grossing films of all time disseminated across the world, primarily from the US, 99 of those directors have been men, and 95 of them white. Now, white men comprise 31% of the population, so it's not about numbers, it's about power. Again, profoundly homogeneous group. And let's face it, they tend to be at the top of the hierarchy in class, right? in other, other social dimensions, so they're the least likely to have authentic cross-racial relationships. But they get to tell everybody's story. And they get to do it by, as their position is not in any particular, not coming from any particular perspective at all. So in other words, Mike Lee is a filmmaker, he's a British filmmaker, makes beautiful films about the human condition, and Spike Lee is a black filmmaker, and he makes films about black issues. So by always marking Spike Lee's race and not marking Mike Lee's race, we grant to Mike Lee individualism, but also universalism. He can speak for everybody because he's not speaking from any particular position. Right? But Spike Lee, of course, is always limited to his position. So Eva X. Kennedy has a quote I love. We, we may not be the producers of racist ideology, but we've all been the consumers. And we've all absorbed these messages, and it's on each of us to continually try to um, find how, how we've absorbed them and how they might be manifested. So Lorraine Code is a um, uh, feminist philosopher, and she has a quote that I love and that I think is perfect on a college campus. And she says, objectivity requires taking subjectivity into account. And that the closer you are to your own subjectivity, the closer you can be to objectivity. So we have this idea that if you don't name someone's position, if you don't think about them in those kind of terms, they're the objective ones. So Mike Lee's just a filmmaker, but Spike Lee is not objective. Uh, when we read textbooks, right? This is just history, and then this is black history, our special history. Right? The point that Lorraine Code is making is the more you understand the particulars of your position in the world, 
how that position shapes what you see and what you don't see, where your blind spots are necessarily going to be, the more you can um, prepare for that, put, put protections into place for that, the more objective you can actually be, not the less. Okay? I hope that makes sense. So I'm gonna walk you through some questions that were I designed to get us in touch um, with how early we are conditioned into this system and how deeply encoded race is in geography. Uh, so uh, I hope that these open up reflections that you continue to have. You know, in our short period, uh, amount of time, I'll go through them rather quickly. Uh, but I think you'll you'll see uh, where I'm going with that. So, how racially diverse was your neighborhood growing up? And if you grew up in a neighborhood that's changing, think about the dynamics of that. What direction is changing in, and how that affects the perceived value of that space. If your neighborhood was not racially diverse, why was it? If everybody's equal, why don't we live together? And if I asked you that as a young person, as I say, an eight-year-old, you were making sense of the world. How might you have answered that question? So where do people of different races from you live if they didn't live in your neighborhood? And if you are white, I want you to think about black people. If you didn't grow up in a neighborhood that had lots of black folks, well, where were they? They're somewhere. You know they exist. If you watch TV and movies, you know they exist. If you go to the grocery store and you look at some of the labels <laughs> on rice and pancake syrup, you know they exist. So where are they? And you might get an idea in your head of a neighborhood, a city, a country a continent, but see if you can find that, that uh, idea. And what was it like over there where they were? What, what was black space like in your mind? Think about the images that you associate with black space, what we could think of as black space. Were you encouraged to visit neighborhoods where people and races different than your own lived and get to know them and build relationships? So if you're white, were you encouraged to go to places where there would be more black people so you could get to know them? Or were you discouraged from doing that? And if you were discouraged from doing that, how was that conveyed to you? Not, not always explicit, right? What were some of the implicit ways you got that message? Did your parents have a significant number of black friends? Especially if you had the kind of parents who told you everybody's equal? Did they live an integrated life? Did you watch movies and TV shows? Let's think about schools. What were the characteristics of a good school? We definitely have this concept in our society, right? So what makes a school good? What images do you associate with good schools? What about a bad school? We got this concept too. Did your parents have any energy about what kind of school you went to? And if so, why? If everybody's equal, what difference does it make? And for me, that question right there really exposes and makes clear, we know perfectly well everybody is equal. And we know very early on, and the way we talk about schools, I would say the way we fund schools and so on, uh, makes that very, very clear. Okay. And how often have you had a teacher of a different race than your own? Do 
did you study systemic racism in your K through 12 education? Now when I say that, I'm not talking about Martin Luther King in February, or a book about Ruby Bridges, or Rosa Parks. I'm asking, did you study systemic racism, the foundation of the country we live in, uh, in your K through 12? Right? In college, have you studied systemic racism? And if so, is it integrated across all your courses or just special courses? Have your white professors had to demonstrate that they were able to engage with issues of systemic racism in the curriculum and classroom dynamics before they were considered qualified to teach? I'll answer that for you. <laughs> As a professor, no, they were not required. And was that dynamics, are dynamics of systemic racism taking place in the curriculum and in the classroom dynamics? Yes. Will you have to demonstrate that you have a foundational understanding of systemic racism before you can graduate and be certified highly educated? Have you had to demonstrate, or would you have to, uh, that you had a foundational understanding of systemic racism before you could practice the law? or medicine, teach, work with children, work in customer service, banking, counseling, or any other field that has the history of harm towards black and indigenous people, odds are very high that you would not have to demonstrate that if you go into the careers, any of the careers that are listed here. There is a deep history of harm between communities of color and these institutions, and yet you're not going to be required to be able to engage in these conversations in any depth. I'm wanting you to see how white supremacy, the system of racism, keeps getting reproduced. What does it mean when those who control the institutions and the halls of power have no requirement or expectation to be able to have these conversations? And I'm hoping you're aware that in at least 15 states right now, it's illegal for your teachers to say that racism exists. If you did have to demonstrate a foundational understanding, would you have a current job? And this one maybe is for your professors. <laughs> All right. So what are the societal impacts of not being required? to have this information. I want you to see that it's not always the really explicit dynamics, right? That I openly tell you that I don't think this kind of student is as valuable as this kind. It's the more subtleties of not having to know. If you're married and you show me your wedding album, would I see how integrated your friendship circle is? This is for the, for the white folks. Right? who want to tell about how you know they have that roommate and all that. Um, show me your wedding album. And the reason I say that is because our weddings, big or small, tend to be our circles. And on that note, next, how often have you been to a wedding that if it wasn't all white, he was pretty close? And how often have you been to a funeral that if it wasn't all white, it was pretty close? So how confident can those of us who are white be that we know all we need to know, that we already get it, that we read that book, uh, and we're not racist? What I'm trying to do here is push at this lack of humility that so many of us are, who are white have, and this sense of certitude that we already know what we need to know. Because most white people, <laughs> kind of a trick to, I heard the video clip, I didn't see it, go cradle to grave in racial segregation. And I want you to go beyond just I have proximity to people of color. I mean authentic, sustained relationships. That's why I'm talking about uh, weddings and funerals. Right? 
Most white people go cradle to grave in segregation with no sense whatsoever that anything or anyone of value is missing. For me, that's the deepest message of white supremacy of all. That I could move through a society day in and day out in racial comfort. I could move through a racist society in racial comfort as a white person. And then if we're being really honest, white people tend to measure the value of the school or the neighborhood or the space or the country by the absence of black people. And the more black people there are, the less it is perceived to be valuable or safe. And I just need to say that is such a perversion of the true direction of racial harm across the history of this country. So that, those messages are raining down on all of us 24-7. Everybody receives this message. Of course, the impact is different based on whether, you know, or what position you have within this racial hierarchy. But, but nobody can be free of it. So at the same time, what are we taught? It means to be racist. Right? Who's a racist? Huh? We're taught that a racist is an individual. Notice what it does to say it's an individual. Well, then it's that one over there, not this one over here. Who consciously doesn't like you based on race. If it's not conscious, it doesn't count. And who uh, is intentionally mean to them. What does that allow us to do? Well, I didn't mean it, therefore it shouldn't count. How many times have you heard a white person say, but I didn't mean to? Right? So we focus on our intentions. And what we do when we do that is basically say, the impact of my behavior on you is not important. What's important is that I don't need to. So this definition pretty much guarantees <laughs> you're going to have white people very defensive in these conversations or when giving feedback about our inevitable uh, assumptions and patterns across race. So being a nice person, having some proximity to people of color, being against racism, these things make complicity with racism mutually exclusive. Right? You can't be racist if you're nice. And I'm sure you've heard people say, defending somebody by saying, well, he's a really nice guy. Therefore, that couldn't be racist. So, <laughs> there's this concept that, I, I use the word credentialing, right? These are, these are all the ways that white people try to offer up evidence that we're not racist. And I, I like to make a joke, maybe you've heard me make it before, that when I started this work, I thought, I, I can't be racist, I'm a vegetarian. Uh, I would need to be vegan today, but, uh, you know, it was pretty progressive back there in the 80s when I was a vegetarian. I, so this idea, right, um, uh, that we can't be racist and then we like to tell you why, right, or somehow make that point. So this is, I just thought, what's the whitest name I could come up with? <laughs> All right. Um, so what are some of those ways? Well, this is probably the number one. I have a black right? You know, if you really think about it, um, when you think about the evidence that white people give, you have to ask yourself, well, if that distinguishes them from a racist, that must mean a racist can't do those things. And if you apply that to a lot of what you're going to see on this list, we can see that it's not very good evidence. So let me just ask the black folks a rhetorical question. When white people say, I'm not racist, I have a black friend, are you convinced? <laughs> no, but that doesn't do it? Okay. So, white folks, they're rolling their eyes. And let me ask you another question. How many of you have a white person in your life who you know and love dearly and who on occasion reveals a racist assumption or, or point of view? Of course. Look, I, I'm married to a man. Uh, he, he loves me. Uh, but the moment he developed a fond regard for me, all his conditioning under patriarchy didn't vanish, right? And sometimes that sexist 
conditioning comes out. And hilarity ensues. No, uh, so, right? When we're clear that, that that doesn't like free us of these dynamics, but when it comes to race, white people have this really strong idea that it's all about toxicity. All right. I work in a very diverse environment, proximity. Next. I have people of color in my family. I'm from New York. I'm not racist. I'm from Canada. I've heard that many times. I recently heard on two occasions, I'm not racist. I'm from Boston. Okay, I swear, it's even on the record. <laughs> right, so this idea that there's some, some areas that are completely, you know, racist-free zones. I was in Teach for America. I traveled, I was on a mission in Africa. I'm a minority myself, so. This is what I would say uh, to a white person who wants to change the channel over into their oppression. Talk to me about what anti-blackness looks like among your group. I was taught to see everyone saying, I don't know if I can swear, but I'm just going to say, bullshit. Okay. No, you were not. Nobody was taught to see everyone the same or to treat everyone the same, and we don't treat everyone the same. And in many cases, we don't even want to. People have different needs. Uh, this is one I keep hearing uh, lately. Young people today are so much better, so much less racist. So do you know the age of the young man who shot up the the uh, supermarket in Buffalo, or the age of Dylan Rook. We could go on. Young people, they may have a more sophisticated ability to use concepts uh, like systemic racism, but I do not think that young white people today are less racist. And so I think what's more important, this is, this is what I do. I don't say is this true or false, right or wrong, but how does this function? What happens when somebody shares with you what their experience is of, of racism and your response is, well, yeah, but today people are so much better. How does that minimize their experience? Does it expand the conversation or does it close the conversation? So that, that question has never failed me in my efforts to unpack. So how, how do we keep getting these outcomes if this is all that's going on? So I'll repeat that question. How does it function in the conversation when a white person makes that move? So I just want you to think for a, a moment um, about forms of credentialing you've heard, uh, you've been the recipient of, if you're a person of color, or that you've used. It may be not something that, uh, that is on this list, but that you're thinking about it. Uh, you realize, ooh, I've done that. <laughs> and, and then just, just take that question home with you. How did it function when I made that move? Uh, why might that actually be unconvincing? Because I feel confident to say not one piece of evidence on this list is typically convincing to people of color. And actually, Erin Trent Johnson is a black woman I used to co-lead with, and she says, when I hear a white person saying something like, I don't see race, or this or that, what I'm thinking is, this is a dangerous white person. This is a white person who's going to deny my reality, who has no sense of awareness of their own whiteness, and that I'm probably not going to be able to be real with. So let's look at some of the more um, subtle uh, or implicit forms uh, that you, of racism that you'll see from what we might want to call well-meaning or progressive white folks, uh, the thousand daily cuts. And notice how hard these are to get your hands on. This is another reason why I think that these forms are more insidious. I've had so many black people say to me, give me the old school, in-your-face, white national. I know where they're coming from. I know how to protect myself. But this smiling, you know, to my face with the underlining behind the scenes is so much more maddening. Okay. So, avoiding discussions of race altogether because they're uncomfortable. Fear of saying, or have you ever seen, I heard a white person drop their voice when they say black or African American. Uh, 
complaining that now we can't say anything right and have to watch everything we say as if that's just too much to ask, that we might be thoughtful about what we think and say, asking now what do they want, uh, debating people because of experience. I'm just going to play the devil's advocate here. Equating all opinions as equal, right? I have the right to my opinion. Well, you do, but it still doesn't make it informed. I want to think about it like this. I have an opinion on the sky. I've seen it every day of my life. I like it best at dusk. It's really pretty twilight. I can tell you where the big and little differs are. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson comes in the room. I'm shutting up. <laughs> okay? I'm sitting back. If you use some language I don't understand, I'm not going to tell him not to use that language. I'm going to think I better look that up. Right? Because I, I recognize that while I have an opinion, it's not informed. And so I have humility. But when it comes to race, so many of us who are white don't have humility. So changing the channel. The real oppression is class. Or even in a talk like this, this is kind of sensitive, but we, it, we are focusing a lot on black and white and anti-blackness and it's Black History Month. But just like class, when we think about Latinx people and black people, there are incredible um, potential solidarity that could serve everybody. But these, uh, these separations, right, these kind of pitting them against each other, who has it worse or better, uh, what, what does that distract us from, and who's not who's not getting challenged, right? So poor white people and people of color's interests are uh, very much aligned, but racial animus is used again and again, incredibly effectively, uh, to have poor and working class white people aligning with, with people who do not have their interests and use racism to. Uh, manipulate them. Okay. Uh, positive thinking, minimizing, you, you must have misunderstood. Uh, let, me, let me explain what they probably really meant. Or, you know, you really shouldn't be so negative. You should give people a bit of the doubt. So I'm going to share with you a New Yorker cartoon that I just love. Maybe you should ask yourself why you're inviting all this duck hunting into your life right now. All right, so apathy, not showing up for diversity events, right? Expressing hostility towards racial justice efforts, assuming that racism is only a person of color problem and not supporting white students and faculty to develop the skills to confront racism. Concerns that talking about race makes white students feel bad, which assumes, I want you to think about this for a minute, this assumes that white students can only relate to enslavers and not abolitionists. I'd like, I wish I could say that the African Americans could have ended uh, enslavement, but they couldn't. White people had to end enslavement. And, and white people worked, there were abolitionists, and it eventually came to pass. When we tell our true history, we give role models that are important for white people. So this assumption that they're only going to feel bad because they identify with the enslaver is problematic. So white solidarity uh, is wanting to protect another white person's feelings or help them stay face and having that be more important than interrupting racism. And you see this when like somebody says something in the meeting and everybody cringes because you don't want to embarrass your colleague. And so you, you let it go, which of course is a very powerful message to your colleagues of color. Only seeing isolated incidences rather than patterns and focusing on the exception wanting to focus on the exception. Right? Yes, there are exceptions to every rule, but there's a rule that we need to be looking at the rule. Silence, playing it safe, I'm not going to show myself, I'm not going to take any risks. So I want you to go back in your mind to the picture of all those men, the Freedom Caucus at that table, and I want you to imagine that I go in that room and I say, I've been in there for about a month, 
And I was invited in because they want some uh, gender diversity, right? So I, I'm the gender diversity. And I'm supposed to let them know if they inadvertently express any gender bias. About a month in that group, you think I'd have a nice long list? I think I'd have a nice long list of all the ways that I experienced sexism in that room. Um, and so eventually, you know, he said he wanted me on the committee to bring diversity. So I raised my hand, I share, and I met the silence. Do you think I'm thinking, this is going great? I'm going to assume hostility that that's going to be the assumption I'm going to make. From a position of power, silence is a power move. You leave the marginalized wondering where are you coming from, and the assumption if you don't show different is typically that you aren't different. If you don't show yourself. So what happens when we get feedback? Right? Based on all this conditioning that I've tried to lay out and make visible, all, all that people call have to navigate in white space or certainly white control space. Okay? Well, I'm sure we've seen all of these responses, and this is what I call white fragility. The inability to handle a challenge to our positions, our in sense of entitlement to be racially comfortable our sense of entitlement to be coddled and taken care of. Um, so we'll claim that we've been attacked, we'll focus on our intentions, we'll insist that, that it was a misunderstanding. No, 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 you misunderstood. Anybody ever heard a white person insist that it was a misunderstanding? So here's what I would say. What if actually it wasn't a misunderstanding at all? They, they understood exactly what you meant. They understood exactly what you really meant. What you don't understand is how what you really meant is coming from a racist paradigm. Th this is the part where we need that humility. What if it's you that doesn't understand? And why do you choose? Defensiveness, nonsensical, irrelevant rebuttals, <laughs> such as I didn't own slaves and the Irish were discriminated to, and that's reverse racism. So, again, this is what I call white fragility. Um, we're fragile in the sense that it doesn't take much to cause what I, what I call the white fragility meltdown. Um, but it's not fragile at all in its impact because the marshals behind it the weight of institutional power and control. The expectation that the institution will back me, not me. And we certainly see this across, across history. You might, might slowly be changing if we have a video that is clear enough that the person was innocent. We might, uh, they might have a chance. But typically, the institutions are gonna back, back the oppressors. Right? Um, So this claim, I am not racist, is functionally meaningless. So let me give you this quote from my uh, colleague, Anita Naila, she's a black woman, and she says, don't spend so much energy fighting this idea that you could possibly be racist. That's a total waste of time. It's like a bunch of white people lined up, hiding behind this real skinny pole, and we see you. And uh, I think this is why even Kindy says the opposite of racist isn't not racist, it's anti-racist, which is active, not passive, right? I cannot tell you how liberating it is to just start from the premise that of course you've been thoroughly conditioned into this, and now you can eagerly seek to find it and root it out as best you can, which is a long, lifelong process, as opposed to this constant insisting that it can't be. It, it's actually free. Okay, next. So, another quote from Anita. <laughs> being with white people who think they get it is like being a driving instructor and having someone who doesn't know how to drive but thinks they do get in the car with you. They're at the wheel and in control, but because of how they see themselves, they can't hear you. And if they do hear you, they're not really listening. And that makes them that 
pills are my answer to my black eyes. <laughs> okay. So rather than thinking out there as an either or, think about it as a continuum. It's not going to end in my life in my lifetime. And where am I on that continuum in any given moment? Right? In some moments, I am engaging in ways that we, we could see as more anti-racist, and there are moments when I'm engaging in ways that are less so. But ultimately, it is for people of color to decide, to decide that in any given moment I am behaving in ways that they experience as anti-racist. I'm the least qualified to make that determination because I'm the most invested in not seeing my racism. This is why authentic relationships are critical. So we gotta change the question from if I've been shaped by this system to how. And, and I just, um, I feel the need to say why I'm focusing on, on how white people get socialized. I'm hoping the folks of color in the room are also thinking, well, how do these messages affect me, right, you? Um, and your work is different than our work, but we all have to work within this, right? It's a, it's a relationship. Okay, so. One more click. I don't know if this is where you're at right now, but this is often where people are at at this point. Okay, okay, I did it, now what do I do? So, this is what I, I'm gonna offer a challenge and I'm gonna give you some what, what you can do. Um, the challenge I would offer you is, how have you managed not to know? It's 2023. <laughs> the information's everywhere. They've been telling us forever. It takes energy and effort not to see or know, what I call willful ignorance. Right. So that question is meant to be a challenge, but it's also a sincere question. Right? Because if you were to take out a list and start to write, why don't I know what to do? There will be a map, and nothing on it will be easy, but everything on it you can, you can do. I wasn't educated on racism, okay? <laughs> um, I live a segregated life. I haven't really cared. And so on. You can, you can address those things. So, uh, these are gonna be framed in the positive, right? This isn't necessarily my list. I can't say that I can do every one of these things on here, but I didn't want to put it in the double. So this is like a person who's engaged in this work in an ongoing way, a white person, should be able to say most of these things and what they can't say, then that tells them what they might want to work on. So, I demonstrate informed knowledge and awareness of the issues of racism, I continually educate myself on racism and the perspectives of a range of groups of color. I hold awareness of my whiteness my, or my proximity to whiteness, and it guides how I engage. Uh, I'm involved in anti-racist projects and programs. I make sure anti-racism is part of the discussion in meetings and project planning. I avoid personalizing racial issues as they're raised in conversation. I can identify many aspects of racism as they're happening. I don't have to just depend on people of color to take all the risks and do all the work. I attend to group dynamics to ensure the inclusion of people of color. I support and validate their contributions. I have personal relationships and know the private lives of a range of people of color, including black people. I've developed the skills to strategically intervene in racist dynamics. I've demonstrated that I can accept leadership from people of color. I've demonstrated that I'm open to feedback on my own racial patterns. I have the skills to repair racism when I realize I have perpetuated it. And I recognize my own limitations in doing anti-racist work and have set up ways to stay engaged and be accountable to people of color. I understand that this work requires courage and a commitment to an ongoing lifelong process no one has ever done. 
And I want to give you three resources that I love because they're active. Okay? So the first one is Dr. Eddie Moore. He's the founder of the White Privilege Conference. And in case you didn't know there was such a thing, there is. <laughs> and it's not just any conference. Uh, the White Privilege Conference is there to look at white supremacy and systemic racism. And Dr. Eddie Moore is the founder. And he co-wrote a 21-day equity, which is a racial equity habit building challenge. And what I love about this is, is you choose a, a task, a reading, a film, a, a question each day for 21 days. You can do it on your own, you can do it with a group. Um, but it keeps you engaged every day as opposed to just a flat kind of reading of a book. The next one is um, Resma Menikin, so my grandmother hates hands. Resma Menikin is a, a therapist and a racial trauma specialist. He's incredible. Um, this book is also kind of active. Um, this book is actually written for, for everybody. And it's not just specifically you know, to white people or, or around whiteness, but it's, it's as you're reading, he gives you thought experiments and things with you. Talks about it, um, racism being embodied, that we, we absorb it inside of ourselves. And then finally, we got last one, Layla Sad's book, Me and White Supremacy Workbook. I love this one. Um, again, every day you're, you're doing tasks and reflections, and it's quite powerful. She has a really good newsletter and does classes too. Okay, what do we got? I'm a big believer in affinity work, and affinity work is where we separate by our shared um, racial identity, so white people get together, ideally um, African American people, Latinx people, mixed race people, but you, you get together people who share your racial identity to work on what's specific to your group and to be able to do that without having to do it in the presence of other group. So um, I, I do a training of facilitators, and this is the book, and um, next year is coming out the handbook for a new group of color affinity groups, which of course are not the same thing that I would write. So I'm gonna close with a couple of images to counter the images we saw earlier. Uh, um, remember that niceness is not anti-racism. Niceness doesn't indicate the absence of racism. In a lot of ways, niceness functions to prevent authentic anti-racist conversations and actions uh, because niceness is not courageous and anti-racism takes courage. So one beautiful picture I want to show you, two beautiful pictures. That is a painting by uh, Harmonio Rosales, I think it's exquisite. Uh, and then here is an illustration um, by um, Chinevea Ibi. And I don't know if it, what happens for you, but think about what did or didn't happen for you with the other images you saw, and then what happens when you actually see these images. So thank you very much, um, and we're going to move to the Q and A, which will be moderated. Thank you.
my dead personal son to you. <laughs> All right, so we have uh, completed cards. Okay, Dr. D'Angelo, while there, you know, the college students. So you all know why we gotta write them down, right? right. You just do not want to let the mic loose when the topic is raised. Well, I have a question. <laughs> I, have, I have a reminder. Great. Okay. Uh, when you're talking about uh, urban universities, model urban universities, where there tends to be conflict, what we call comparative misery, everybody got something going on. How do we continue to focus on the anti-racism discussion when everybody else is kind of bringing their baggage to the table too? Thank you for that question. But I am proudly identified as an angry feminist. I have no shame. <laughs> it breaks my heart that any, uh, anyone wouldn't want to identify with them. So my point is that I, uh, I understand that patriarchy and misogyny are real uh, and that I have suffered from them. I grew up in poverty. Uh, classism is real. Uh, so why do I center racism in my work? Because I actually think that it is the most difficult of all. It doesn't mean necessarily, I don't want to get into what's the worst, but I think in our society, it's the hardest to talk about. And if I can build my skills there, those skills will translate to every other form of oppression. And you can't talk about any other form of oppression without talking about how racism shapes one's experience of that oppression. It's easy. I have spent my life thinking about where I have gotten less than other people because I'm a woman, because I was raised poor. But what's really challenging, what really was cutting edge for me, is sitting in the seat of the oppressor and taking a deep, hard, honest look about how I, at how I have benefited from somebody else's oppression. That's my learning edge. Uh, and so I think to, to keep racism on the table, we have to understand that um, we all are going to benefit from doing that. Is what, what another thing that ends up happening is you get everything on the table so that nothing's really done in any depth, especially not racism. Racism is often the first one to go. So do notice what forms, there are forms of oppression that are easy to talk about, uh, and that allow uh, white people to, to be in more of a victim position. It doesn't mean that we aren't victimizing other forms of oppression, but we've spent most of our lives looking at that. Let's, let's, I, I want to go for the harder stuff, right? And I'm going to repeat it. If you can go deep on this issue, that will translate to every other issue you could possibly address. Thank you. All right, we have our questions coming up. Now remember, these are students. So students ain't nice. All right, so here's the first question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Laura. You guys are really going to ask questions. All right, you marshal, <laughs> you marshal a lot of reality, but point people in the wrong direction. We don't need another. There's no questions here. Yeah, yeah but there's no questions here. So that's, that's a statement. So we're right there. See, see how y'all act? Okay. All right. Write it down on a card. Write it down on a card, and if it's a question, we will ask it. All right. How should we address white fragility in a system change work that is often led by white people? Well, yeah, please. Thank you. That's kind of a million-dollar question. Um, so I'm going to maybe answer that a little bit indirectly because sometimes people say, "Oh, you're just talking about interpersonal." You know, you're not talking about structural, and that, that it's all about structural, we have to change the structures, okay. So, I think if you're really listening to me, um, I am hitting both of those things. So, institutions are not people, but people make up institutions. And you can mandate behavior through policy change if you do not do, uh, address the resentment and the bias uh, that those who are being forced to make those policy changes that they, that they hold, 
it's not going to happen. So affirmative action is a great example of a policy change, a structural systemic change, a law. And where are we today with affirmative action? First of all, it has not been particularly effective. White women have benefited the most from affirmative action policies. It's, I can't believe how much resentment so many white people have, and white men in particular, about this program. And it's pretty much gone. And that's because you mandated behavior, but you didn't address the hostility and the resentment and the anti-blackness in this case, because the number one association people have with affirmative action is they think about unqualified black people are getting something over on me. So you have to address that uh, as well as policy. You have to do them together. This is also why we can add people into our institution, but they don't stay. Why don't they stay? Because we haven't addressed the water we're adding them into. And unaddressed whiteness is hostile. So I don't remember the question. <laughs> That's fine. Take your time. <laughs> All right. Here's a question that you actually answered earlier in our, our luncheon meeting. Uh, Tyreek Nichols was beaten and killed by five black men. Why? Was that racism? Yeah. You know, Evie Kinney, I hope you know his work because he's a brilliant uh, black scholar. He wrote How to Be an Anti-Racist. He says that um, black people can be racist, and I, I have for a very long time said that only white people can be racist. He and I have been in dialogue together, we're both perfectly fine uh, with what we mean by that. So before, before I go into it, let me just say, um, don't split hairs over, well, okay, but then she says this and he says that, and which one is right. Just, you know, whatever works for you to get you involved, just go with it. Um, but what, what Dr. Kindy is saying is that black people can and do uphold a racist system, right? I'm just, <laughs> Clarence Thomas, excuse me. <laughs> my um, black men were programmed yeah. to, to prove that they were bluer than everybody else. We had a, we had a very lively discussion on that earlier. Yeah, so, <laughs> so we all internalize those messages of anti-blackness. In many ways, I would say, for white people to have good neighborhoods, we have to have a police state in other neighborhoods. We, for a very long time, we haven't seen what goes on there, and we haven't been interested in seeing what goes on there, as long as it's contained over there, and my uh, home value is good over here. So everyone absorbs it. Um, who does it serve? Uh, what does it uphold? Uh, is what the question we have to always ask. But yes, so yes, people of color can be racist, if you will, but it still serves white supremacy. It doesn't serve them, except in really individual isolated cases, maybe they get some money or whatever, but I'm talking about the, the system. Right. I, I don't believe that those officers would have been a white man in that same way. I just don't. And I also have, I can't help but wonder uh, if they would have been accused of murder as quickly if they were not black. Okay. In a post-Trump era, or in a shift of racial dynamics, why would a white person care if he or she is perceived as a racist? Well, it's kind of interesting. Um, so there's a couple ways that I can interpret that question. I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable only that I have been conditioned into racism, that I have a racist worldview, right? I, I have racist uh, uh, patterns and assumptions and biases. And I have often said that I don't think Donald Trump is any uh, more racist than I am. And people are like, what? So let me just clarify. There's nothing that comes out of his mouth that I don't recognize. When he talks about X types of countries, or why Norway's better, or what kind of people are coming across the border, well, we've never heard those things before. We've all been exposed to those narratives. Uh, it's not a foreign language he's speaking that I don't understand. We, we both hold that language, right? There's a difference between us, however, of course, in that I have committed my life to challenging that socialization, and he embraces and amplifies it. It doesn't really serve me to set him up as a racist and me not. 
right? I think that's really, really important. So in that way, if you say Rob was racist, like I'm comfortable with that because how could I not be in all the ways I try to make it visible? In, in general, but if you were to say to me that thing you just said, it, that definitely hurt me as racism. Like that is, I mean, that's not okay with me in the sense that I want to know that. I care to know that, and I want to try to repair that. Right? So, so I don't mean it in a glib, yeah, whatever. Right? And I hope that distinction is making sense. Yeah. So why should we care? I'm not really sure what was meant by that, but. Okay, this is uh, dealing with another question we talked about earlier uh, in terms of Latino and blackness. How do black people help Latinx folks realize that they perpetuate anti-black racism? Um, how, how do we? It's the first part? The first part was how do black people help Latinx folk realize that they perpetuate anti-black racism? Yeah. I, I may not be the best person to answer that question. That would probably be a really powerful dialogue. That would be, be, our, be our next distinguished <laughs> speaker. Good. <laughs> Great book out that talks about oh, okay. Latino anti black All right. Okay. While not sexy or incendiary a term, I've always considered racism racist to describe the systems of oppression and prefer to use the term bigot for individuals who act racist. Can you comment? Um, it's funny. To your definition as to what is a racist. Yeah, I, I mean, I have a different response to the word bigoted. Um, I think it's very important that we always hold that difference between um, what you're bigoted about and what I'm bigoted about, and then what is the power structure that either backs us or doesn't back us, right? So this is why I reserve that term racism to talk about white people's bigotry and not to talk about black people's bigotry. Because what, ha what ends up happening is we just kind of erase the profound reality of institutional power and legal authority. It, it actually, um, what is the word that I want? It's, it's a perversion of power, right? We, we have to hold that because the impact is so, so foundationally different. So I guess I would ask that person just to sit with, so how does it function? I don't want you to answer this wherever you are. I don't want to get into it. Um, but why is that more important to you? And if it's more important to you to use the word bigot because you can apply it to everybody, then we're just back to that wanting to say everybody is prejudiced or everybody is bigoted. Yes, everybody is, but only one group is back to power. And you can't trivialize the difference in impact. So I often use the example of women's right to vote. So women white women who were granted the right to vote in 1920. Uh, if I, if in 1919, I could be a very angry feminist and suffragette. Uh, I could be mean to a man one-on-one -on -one if he came into my shop, but I couldn't, my group couldn't systematically deny every single member of his group their civil rights. But this group couldn't deny every member of my group my civil rights. We're both Bigoted, what was the difference? Well, his was back to power. And they, we just can't take that off the table. Right. How did you react to white people stressing to buy your book during 2020? Did you notice any positive or negative interactions or experiences? Oh, yeah. Don't Google me, okay? <laughs> Let me just say I'm not on social media. Uh, I don't think I could get up in the morning if I was. Um, if you if you understood what I was saying in my book, it would lead you to read other authors, right? It should never be the only book you read. Right. And if it was the only book you read, then you really didn't understand it. Um, so I do feel confident that I offered something that was different than what folks of color were offering, which is an insider's viewpoint and making it undeniable for people who share that identity. If, if, you, if white people can hear it better when it comes from me, then I'm going to use this voice to help them hear it. And then hopefully they go in the direction uh, of starting to listen to people of color. Right? 
to not use this position would not be acceptable. And I want to share something, because it's not directly in there, but I, one of the critiques is, oh, well, people are buying this white person's book, and they're not reading black authors. So over the last five years leading up from, uh, it was about 2021, and go back five years, there were 62 books about race on the New York Times bestselling list. So over that course of five years, 62 of the bestsellers were about race. 59 were written by black people. Three were written by white. One was The Color of Law, one was Mine, and one week in the summer of 2020, uh, Debbie Irvin's Waking Up White was on there. So it's just, it's just not true that people aren't reading other authors, but there is, there is a way that I can explain it that obviously has been really accessible for other white people. Okay. Only two more questions, then y'all gonna go, go buy some books, right? <laughs> All right, so what suggestions do you have for black people when white people unprompted begin talking about race? This happens to me a lot because I look friendly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, so first of all, I want all the white people to hear that, right? Like, um, sometimes I open with a, with a little story, and I didn't this time, but I did that exact thing. I, I went to dinner um, with a couple that I hadn't met before. We were meeting at the restaurant. They were friends of my friend. And, and I saw when I got there that they were both black. And I, I was excited because I, I hadn't been around a lot of black people at that point in my life. And I also felt a sense of urgency that they immediately know that I wasn't racist. <laughs> I mean, it really doesn't happen. Whatever comes next, you know, is going to be problematic, right? Because I'm, I'm excited and I'm urgent. And so I proceeded to credential myself. You know how I did it? I just cringed. I told them how racist my family was. <laughs> I told, oh my God, you won't believe they said this, they said that, they tell this joke, can you believe how racist they are? Thinking that what I'm committing is, see, I see that that's a racist and ignorant thing to say, and I wouldn't say that. But what I actually was doing was subjecting that poor couple to racism all night long. In many ways, but one was, it wasn't lost on them that I immediately took the conversation to I would never take a competition race if they were white. Right, so white folks just breathe. <laughs> Slow down. Show, don't tell. Um, and don't do that. Don't reduce constantly uh, people call to, to the race conversation. They don't know, they don't know you. Um, you know, they don't know where you're coming from. You want to build a little trust. So I want to give a quote from Pat Parker, I, I actually think a quote of white fragility. She's a black woman, and she says, first, forget that I'm black. And I think what she means by that is stop reducing me to that, stop bringing everything to that, stop having that be the only thing I can ever speak to. And second of all, don't you ever forget that I'm black. And I have a different experience and a different reality than you do. And it's that balance. We, we don't want to pretend we don't notice that they're black, but we don't want to uh, objectify them either. And the more relations you have across race, the maybe more relaxed you can be. Okay, last question. What and how did your safe self-work on racism begin, and what was your moment of discovery? That's a good question, Dan, isn't it? Um, first of all, keep in mind it's a lot like water dripping on a rock, right? It, it was, it, there were moments I could share with you, but it, it's not as if then I got it from there on out. Because the, the messages of white superiority are coming at me 24-7. Even as I stand on the stage, they're coming at me 24-7. As I stand on this stage as a distinguished speaker, consciously or not, you're getting reinforced too in who, who's always in front of you as authority and role models, right? So whiteness is being reproduced even as we stand here seeking to interrupt it. So every moment that I push back against it, it's coming back at me. And this is why we can never just think we're done, you know, we have to be persistent. But I'm, I'm going to um, be honest, I was reading Peggy McIntosh's article about the invisible knapsack of privilege. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this article, it came out in the 80s, 
that I believe her. There was a white woman who was in women's studies, so she's always going on about male privilege, but her colleagues of color were always pushing her to look at her privilege. And so she sat down and she made this list of like 48 privileges she took for granted every day. And I can tell you where I was sitting when I read it. I felt like I was, I felt so white. Like, I was like, I don't want to go outside because I'm so, everyone can see how white I am. But that was the first time I ever felt white rather than just normal. So it was this contrast of, uh, like a fish being out of water moment, was reading that list and realizing, oh my God, I can say any one of these privileges too. I move through the world in a particular way I've never thought about before, but that not everybody can take for granted. Okay, well, on behalf of California State University's Dominguez Hills and the Mervyn Donnelly African American Political Economic Institute, uh, we'd like to thank you uh, for being this year's distinguished speaker, and we'd like to give you this little plaque of appreciation. Coming to our campus.